before we go into our interview today, I wanted to let everyone know we have a new sponsor for our Energy Question podcast, the U.S. Oil and Gas Association, or USOGA for short. First established in 1917, USOGA has been an effective and creative voice for the industry for more than a century now. USOGA is dedicated to educating the public, policymakers, and legislators at the federal, state, and local levels about the value of the domestic oil and natural gas industry. If you're in the industry and not currently a USOGA member, please consider joining the association as a way of helping it tell your story to the policymakers whose actions impact everything you do each and every day. You can start that process by contacting USOGA through its website, usoga.org. Thanks so much to USOGA for sponsoring the Energy Question podcast, and now on with our show. Hey, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and today my very special guest is Dr. Robert Brooks, the CEO of RBAC, one of the global leaders in energy market simulation systems. Robert, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you. We're both in the in the great state of Texas, I see, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, God bless Texas. That's all I can say. I've been here all my life, and I guess I'll die here someday soon. So, um, well, you I, know, I, 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 I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could. You know, there you go, <laughs> like Davy Crockett. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, first of all, should I should I call you Doctor Brooks? Should I call you Robert? Should I call you Bob? Uh, you can call me anything you want, pretty much. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, normally my uh, friends and and colleagues just call me Bob, and uh, sometimes uh, you know, and it's a little more formal context. We get a you know, Doctor Brooks, but uh, right. but uh, you know that doctoring business that happened a long, long time ago. So <laughs> between friends, Bob's fine. Okay, all right, Bob. Well, here we go. Uh, first, um, I, you know, I. I our audience, this is the first time I've interviewed you, so our audience won't be familiar with your company. So take a few minutes to talk about your company, what you do, and, and what exactly is involved in energy market simulation systems. Okay, well, you know, for a very long time, uh, you know, really all my life, I've been interested in mathematics, okay? So uh, in one form or other, but uh, it's always been applied mathematics. You know, something that has a definite goal as opposed to some abstract or theoretical. And um, as I as I grew up and found out more about the world in, in college and graduate school and so forth, I actually had an opportunity to uh, learn a lot about energy systems. And, you know, it's largely in one way or another logistics. It's moving something from one place to another. And, of course, um, uh, this can be done well or it can be done bad. I and mean, there's a whole subject called logistics, right? Which has to yeah. do with basically trying to get stuff from here to there, you know, where it's needed, from where it's produced to where it's needed in an efficient manner. Well, there's a whole mathematics that's involved in, in actually uh, modeling or simulating uh, that whole kind of operation. And uh, one of the things I learned in, in college is that you know, if you if you formulate this thing correctly, not only can you get information about flows of, of product from one kind to another, whether it's cargo or whether it's natural gas or water or whatever, but there's also information you can use to get prices. So um, it's it's very interesting. If you do it correctly, you could actually simulate what a market should be like. Now they're not always this way. Of course, they're not always efficient and so forth, but it's kind of like an ideal, an ideal situation. Ideally, yeah. this is how things should flow. Ideally, this is how, uh, you know, pricing should be in the market. And uh, as you get a little bit more and more uh, sophisticated in this whole thing, you realize, well, you know, it's not ideal. You know, there's all kinds of barriers and difficulties and congestion and and constraints and so forth. So you learn to add those into the equation and, and try to make it more, more, more real. And so that's what we do. You know, we are focused in natural gas, although we have done natural gas liquids, for example, and, and in the past I've worked with other commodities, including even 
uh, oil and, and uh, freight, coal, and various other kinds of energy commodities. But um, what we do is we produce a, a set of software products that we license out to the energy industry, and by the way, government or other organizations too, in order for them uh, to be able to uh, simulate what uh, the um, what the the system might look like, the natural gas delivery system might look like in the future, you know, based on different decisions that are made. And so by doing so, then an energy company uh, can uh, basically get a better sense of, you know, the way that things are going and therefore make better decisions for themselves regarding their own investments. And uh, an energy regulator, for example, or government agency, uh, can also do uh, forecasts of what things are likely to be out into the future, but also can apply it to policy making. So, um, you know, the hope is that by doing so, they will be able to look at different possible policies going out in the future and then decide among them uh, regarding uh, the objectives of the energy system, which should be, you know, to deliver product at a low cost, you know, to the consumer. Uh, while still being able to uh, make it worthwhile for producers and transporters to operate. So, you know, that's the idea. And uh, we've done very well. We started quite a while ago. Um, and we have, um, uh, I don't know, 25 or 30 licensees, something like that. And then, you know, occasionally they ask us to do studies. And so we do studies using our own software as well, you know, for various, again, organizations uh, to help them, whatever their purposes are, uh, you know, involving, again, focus almost entirely on natural gas. So, so what's your focus? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to, the last thing I was going to say is our focus was on North America until fairly recently, uh, but we did well enough uh, in that particular area. I feel like we really understand the uh, North American gas delivery system, which includes Canada and Mexico, as well as the United States. Um, and so a few years ago, we decided to shift our focus and and uh, tackle the whole world. And that's a bigger problem, <laughs> obviously. Yes. Uh, but, you know, we've done that and we have a, a really nice system uh, called G2M2, Global Gas uh, Market Model. Um, hmm, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, uh, G2M2. Uh, so, yeah, that's right, G2M2, Global Gas Market Model. Um, and uh, it's uh, getting off the ground, and, uh, you know, the, the people that are using it uh, are very happy with it. It's really meeting their needs, and, you know, that's what we wanted. You know, what we want to see in the end is uh, better energy decisions and policies made globally because in that way it's going to benefit the most people. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's the idea. Well, we've had so many upsets uh, in the global system for delivery of natural gas since, particularly since Vladimir Putin decided to invade Ukraine and uh, the blowing up of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines that took place. And that kind of rejiggered everything in terms of where, where cargoes were going from the United States and from, from the other exporting countries uh, with a major focus on Europe rather than Asian markets. Um, but now we have the Houthis. <laughs> in the Red Sea and uh, the disruption that's causing in the shipping lanes for, for LNG and pretty much everything else, trying to avoid the Red Sea and I guess having to go around the Cape of Africa to, to get to their markets. Um, what, uh, what kind of impacts is that having that you're seeing on, on the global LNG markets? Well, you've, uh, you've sort of Throwing a, a bunch of stuff at me right there. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's true though. I mean, it is yeah. a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, the you know the main. Uh, let's just start with the last thing first. Yeah, I mean, the major impact is really on Middle Eastern um, gas supplies and LNG supplies to Europe, uh, because previously uh, they've been able to travel from, let's say, Qatar, uh, in the the Persian Gulf. Uh, around uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and into the Red Sea through the Suez Canal, through the Mediterranean, and then to market. Uh, but now uh, they've decided even the 
you know, even the Qataris, at first they were, you know, going to continue, but they have even decided that it's too dangerous. Yeah. I mean, these cargoes are worth lots and lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's very important. So they have to go around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and Africa is huge, by the way. If you look at a map, you know, Africa is not some little thing. I mean, it's right. really <laughs> Uh, so I did a calculation yesterday in preparation for this uh, call, and it the voyage is actually 75% longer uh, to get to Zeebrugge, Belgium, which is a major hub in Europe, uh, by going around Africa rather than going through the Suez Canal. So you can imagine if you're increasing uh, the distance, that means you're increasing also the time that it takes. And so it's 10, 15 days longer. It's 75% longer in terms of time. Um, and basically the cost of transportation is directly proportional almost, you know, with time. So you're almost doubling, you know, the, the transportation costs associated with those cargoes. That's, that's not in, you know, that is big. I mean, that, that's, that's really big. big. So there are those things. Um, we had a, you know, that's more like a, a geopolitical in a way or, you know, something yeah. like that. But, you know, we have a situation also that's a little bit similar in Panama, uh, which is uh, the Lake uh, Gatton uh, in, uh, in Panama uh, is uh, suffering from, I guess, low rains for, for quite a while. Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, its uh, depth is is really low, and and that means it's harder to operate the Panama Canal, and so they've had to reduce the flow volume through the Panama Canal, which means that ships are waiting longer to get through. Again, you've got that time lengthening, and a lot of LNG uh, shipping uh, is they've just decided instead of going through the Panama Canal, they're going to go around the tip of South America. So it's almost identical kind of a situation, you know, to what you you had, but probably even worse in terms of overall distance. So there you have a more natural phenomenon, a weather related phenomenon, that's a persistent one. And um, the, the fact is that you can actually do that kind of modeling with our software. In other words, we can basically say, let's cut off the uh, number uh, or the the volume, the rate at which LNG tankers can flow through the Suez Canal or through the Panama Canal over a one month period or a three month period or a 12 month period or whatever, and look at what, you know, what the effect is going to be. And it's uh, considerable in terms of uh, prices. Yeah. Uh, prices that, uh, again, in Europe or uh, not so much in Asia, of course, um, and, you know, the Suez Canal cutoff or the Red Sea cutoff is much, you know, worse, really, than, uh, than the cutoff of or reduction in the Panama Canal. What would be even worse and really worse, and we've done this uh, study also, uh, something that pops up every once in a while is the potential for Iran uh, mining uh, the Strait of or moves, yeah, yeah. Okay, which is a narrow body of water, you know, between um, the uh, Ara Arabian Peninsula and Iran. Uh, and if that were to happen, I mean, uh, and and Qatar LNG was cut off totally. I mean, that would have a huge effect on the uh, global market. Now, I don't think it's really high probability, you know, to give, you know, because the the Iranians, I think, have too much to lose. Uh, themselves by all of this. Uh, but, you know, the point is that you can actually study this in advance and see what kind of impact that you possibly could. Just one and more. That actually happened once before, right back in the 1980s. And, and yeah. Ronald Reagan retaliated by sinking half of the Iranian Navy <laughs> when they did it. So, yeah, I, I think they probably wouldn't want to do that now again. Yeah, but there's a little difference between Biden and Reagan. I yes, would there say. is. Yes, there is. So um, do you mind if we just talk one more little story? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted you there. Sorry. No, it was fine. Um, yeah, this is actually a pretty interesting story and reflects well on us, so I'm going to tell it, um, <laughs> which is that, uh, of course, in 2022, 
uh, we had uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, that began that war. And then there were all the repercussions of that. Um, but actually, you know, this is something that started even before. Uh, at the end of 2019, uh, the um, transit agreement on Russian gas pipelines across Ukraine ended and had to be renegotiated. Yeah. And, you know, prior to that, there was through the various ways of getting Russian gas into Europe, there was about a 180 billion cubic meters per day of natural gas was coming from Russia through um, Eastern Europe to Western Europe. So um, the Russians and Ukrainians haven't been getting along for a long time. Yeah. And uh, lots of stuff has happened. But they did renegotiate an extension, a five-year extension, which, by the way, ends at the end of 2024 which happens to be the year we're in, uh, to deliver 40 BCM, uh, quite a bit less, 40 BCM of gas per year across uh, Ukraine into Europe. Now, the strange thing is, while the war has been going on, actually, that agreement has been actually pretty much they're kept. Still delivering the gas, yeah. Uh, and it's like there has to be some kind of cooperation on the part of the Russians and Ukrainians to actually do this <laughs> in some kind of agreement not to bomb the hell out of the pipelines. <laughs> right. now, it's the weirdest, weirdest thing. Uh, so in any case, it ends at the end of this uh, this year and, and we don't know what's gonna happen. It could be zero, you know, probably will be, you know, at the end of this year. But anyway, so there was a big reduction anyway at the beginning of 2020. And then we had COVID, okay, at, at, at end of, uh, we had 20, yeah, 2020, 2021, okay. So the, the volumes didn't actually match up to 40 BCM because demand was way down. In any case, uh, 2022 comes and prices go crazy through the ceiling and everybody's worried about $100 uh, per million BTU gas in Europe and so forth and so on. Anyway, we start running our models and it's really weird because we were looking at our models and prices peaked out like in October, September, October and started coming down fast in the model. Now this is, you know, we were at World Gas Conference, okay? And we could already see that this was starting to happen. I went to another conference I think in October or whatever, and I, I had to decide, am I gonna am I gonna actually deliver these results? Everybody's saying the gas is gonna, you know, go like this, and I'm saying it's gonna go like that. I I decided to deliver the results anyway. And sure enough, that's what happened. And that's exactly what happened, yeah. Exactly what happened. And so, you know, number one is that means actually our models are pretty good, uh, <laughs> you know, which is nice. Uh, and number two is it also speaks to, I think, the resilience of the market, even globally. It's, it's a, you know, we haven't really had a global market until the U.S. started delivering a lot of LNG. Yeah. Uh, but you have the resilience of the market, including darn when those Europeans actually want to get something done, they can actually do it. Uh, and, and so they have. Um, and, you know, it's worked out very well to the point where, you know, I'm looking and I'm saying, well, I don't know that Russia and Ukraine have to make much of an agreement next year. I'm not sure that it's going to be that much needed. So we we actually did a study where we said, OK, no more Russian gas, you know, flowing into Europe. Nothing on Nord Stream. There's still one of those four pipelines is still intact. So theoretically, yeah, they can yeah. deliver a certain amount of, of gas. Um, but nothing through Ukraine, nothing through Belarus. Still, you know, the, through the South, fine. But but that gas is only going to go to Turkey and Southeast Europe. It's not going to go into Central Europe in this in this approach. And see what happens. And we see in the long run, you know, after a few years, it doesn't matter. Uh, prices are up just a little bit compared to what they would have been. But it's almost like, well, why did you know? I mean, it's. It's not good news for the Russians. I'm going to tell no, you. No, it's not. Yeah, that's terrible news. For them. 
Obviously. So, I mean, and what are you going to do? I mean, let's say they win the Ukraine war or the Ukraine gives in or they work a piece or whatever. You think they're going to go back to business as usual in Europe? I don't think so. Yeah, well, they, they, won't, they shouldn't need to. Now, we've had this decision by the White House, which I think has probably been a little overblown in the media uh, to delay the permitting processes for LNG, additional U.S. LNG capacity to export. Through the, you know, through the, after the elections over. And, uh, you know, I slammed it just because it's obviously a purely politically motivated thing. But, but in terms of really having a major impact on America's ability to remain a reliable trading partner in the LNG space, assuming that the permitting processes resume after the election, that's not really going to have a real major impact on uh, the industry's ability to keep delivering LNG to Europe, right? I I honestly think you're right. I, I don't think it's going to have a major uh, impact, although I have to say we haven't actually run this scenario yet. Okay. 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 We've been busy doing some other things, so, but we intend to, believe me, we do. <laughs> um, and it's very easy, really. All you have to do is, you know, make some assumptions, reasonable assumptions about delays on the beginning, of, let's say the startup dates of some new projects, or just cancel the projects, because some of them will be canceled. You know, some, sure. of, the, some of these developers are hanging by a thread uh, right now already. I'm not going to name names, but, you know, you could probably know uh, which ones. And they, you know, they, you know, projects look good. Uh, actually, progress was made in, in terms of getting sponsors and so forth, and then nothing happened. And then you have others that, of course, uh, doing well and, and, you know, uh, I think the major impact would be uh, existing developers who have maybe projects either on the drawing boards or actually projects that are already started. If they are not restricted by the Biden administration from continuing, you know, with these current projects, existing exporters, then then actually they're going to benefit yeah, <laughs> because yeah. these other projects, it's, it's a competitive thing. You know, the uh, the the new guys in town are, are, are not getting to play the game uh, or they're going to be late to the game. And by that time, you know, the uh, contracts may be made more with Qatar or other uh, East Asia, I mean, East uh, Africa, Southeast Africa or other places. But, you know, even thinking about all of these things, you know, you look at the rest of the world and and you could say, well, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in America because the current administration is certainly, you know, very anti-fossil fuel. And and um, uh, if the administration were to change, we know that, uh, for example, Trump would be very pro-energy and pro-LNG and so forth. So that could change things. But still, even with all that, I think the U.S. is still the most reliable, uh, maybe next to Qatar. You know, Qatar is not going to let any of this ge uh, geopolitical stuff interfere with their business. Uh, but, you know, even like Southeast Africa, I mean, they've had so much, you know, they've got plenty of resource, but, yeah, you know, do. trouble, you know, getting that off the ground. And so, you know, Southeast Asia, you know, there are some projects, but they're kind of played out and they're going to end up being more, you know, importing more LNG, strangely enough. I said Southeast Asia. I meant more like, uh, you know, Indonesia and Malaysia. Yeah. yeah. Um, Southeast Asia could grow, you know, as in terms of market. You know, Vietnam and the Philippines have already made some commitments, uh, but they're, you know, relatively small. You know, um, but but it's good. You know, and it's good to kind of differentiate your market so that it's not just all the big players, but you start getting the others in there too. So other than China as the dragon in the room, you know, <laughs> India is the elephant in the room. Uh, and if you add all of South Asia, there's a huge potential in South Asia, you know, for LNG. And uh, it's starting to happen. Um, and the LNG market could grow, but it has to be affordable. Right. And you, you just can't 
You know, I mean, uh, no, no doubt producers would like to have high prices and so forth, but it's like, I think you have to be satisfied with producing efficiently, getting your, um, and, and transporting efficiently, operating efficiently and take a reasonable rate of return on your investment. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, otherwise, Honestly, even our models show, you know, there's limited overall, there's limited growth in the overall LNG market, unless you can get to that point. So, you know, potentially with the number of people that are in Africa, you know, that's also potentially a, a future market, but it's a ways away. And um, if you if you would uh, listen to African leader, energy leaders like Ayuk and, and some others, uh, you know, they are promoting something which I think is very much uh, correct, which is, you know, we don't want to be uh, forever raw material suppliers to the rest of the world and to the Western world and China. We don't want to do that and continue to be un undeveloped, uh, continue to be poor. We don't want that. And we don't want to just be markets for the West either. We have resources ourselves. What we should be doing is developing our own resources for our own development. And the West shouldn't be telling us that we can't do it because it's not wind and solar. You know, and, you know, he's he's made and others have made very strong arguments. I agree with that. But, you know, in terms of the big picture, you know, um, what that would mean is actually if if they do develop go on that development path and they actually develop the their gas resources for their own um, uh, economic uh, welfare and so forth, then they're not going to need LNG either from the United States or from other places because they've got plenty of themselves. So anyway, bottom line, it's, I think we're pretty much stuck with Asia. Uh, South America is potentially also a bit of a market, but it's always very quixotic, you know, and right. Viable. So unstable. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, those are sort of big picture, my view on this whole thing. And uh, thanks for asking that question about Russia, because it's really in a fascinating area. It is. It's, it's amazing. Uh, before we wrap up, we're getting short of time, but I want to also touch uh, on the, the U.S. domestic delivery system for natural gas, uh, which, of course, in recent years has been... Uh, so geared to uh, deliver gas to the uh, LNG export facilities uh, in some parts of the country. What are you seeing there just in terms of, of needs uh, with the infrastructure uh, in the U.S. delivery system in the, the next several years? Well, I think, you know, people are still talking about um, LNG and more uh, infrastructure for LNG. And this is primarily in Texas and Louisiana. Right. Um, the good news is that uh, intrastate pipelines don't have to get FERC approval. Yes. <laughs> okay. So they don't have to get you know the Biden administration to agree. They do have to get people in Austin to agree, um, and in Louisiana to agree. Uh, but you know traditionally, uh, that you know even though there's starting to be pushback, and Austin's actually a, a pretty liberal city. Um, but still, you can go around Austin. Um, you know, there's yes, plenty of land in Texas that you know that you can build pipes, uh, and there's plenty of gas in the Permian and various other uh, you know places. So, I, I I don't really see an interstate issue so much, uh, but from an interstate issue for sure, uh, there's a lot more resistance than there ever was in the past, yeah. and. It, not rubber stamping uh, these projects uh, anymore, now, certainly under the Biden administration or any administration that is going to be largely influenced uh, by uh, the Greens, uh, then it's going to be difficult. There are certain places where you just can't. You know, it's like state of New York, you can't. Uh, right. So in, even if New England wanted more gas, you're not going to get a pipeline through New York, you know. Um, so hey, there's there's lots of issues that we could discuss that are very interesting, David. Maybe maybe today's not the right time. Maybe, maybe. next time, yes. <laughs> uh, exactly. I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't be 
I wouldn't be worried about that as a major issue at this point. Good. Well, great. That's good news. Uh, so let's uh, let's wrap up. Just tell everyone how they can get in touch with RBAC. We we our audience is, you know, made up largely of executives in the industries itself in the energy space. So there may be people wanting to get in touch with you. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you and uh, follow what RBAC is doing. Okay, well, great. Well, I mean, it's really simple. It's just rbac.com or www.rbac.com is our website. All the contact information is on that. So um, I always called it RBAC. Yes. Uh, and then all of a sudden we started hearing people call it RBAC. And so <laughs> we decided not to correct them. I mean, okay, that's what they call us. So, okay. Uh, so rbac.com, rbac.com. And uh, the contact information is there. Plus, uh, if you're an executive and you don't want to wade through the uh, technical discussions or whatever, you can you know, send your, your technical guys and they can review the contents of the website. Although it's actually pretty interesting, to be honest with you. Uh, and we'd be happy yeah, to yes. talk to anybody. You know, we're, um, you know, we, we've had a policy for a very long time, David, that, you know, we talk with folks and you know we tell them the truth of, you know what the, what are they in terms of what they're trying to solve okay and if they're trying to solve a problem that we don't address and our systems don't address that we you know we're, we're pretty straight with them we're not like a consulting company that you know can do anything you know right. i mean if you've been part of a consulting company you know it's like if somebody's going to pay money we can do it <laughs> right. yeah whether you really can or not, you're going to try. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, but we're not that way. We do, you know, we've got very specific products with very uh, specific goals. Uh, I think we do a really good job of supporting our customers. We're well known for that. And, uh, you know, we want our customers in the end, uh, you know, the bigger goal is our contribution to the United States and to humanity, if you will, is to try to help people make better decisions about something that's really important, which is energy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so that's it. And that gets harder and harder to do as things become increasingly complex over time. It's amazing how much more complex the, the complexity advances, you know, just year over year. It's incredible. Um, anyway. Yeah, it's true. That is true. And there, you know, there's always good signs and, and there's good developments. And, you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't really know truthfully the truth or, you know, the degree of truth in that carbon dioxide is bad for our, you know, I've heard both sides. And, um, but uh, on the other hand, if we had some real breakthroughs in some uh, nuclear fusion or something like that, where our electricity could be produced uh, reliably on yes. demand, um, not by solar power off more than 50% of the time or wind, again, same thing, uh, but actually reliably without having to burn stuff, I would say, yep. okay, I mean, if you could do it safely and you can do it efficiently and so forth, well, I, I think that's a great future. And, and to be honest with you, I think we start looking longer term, we have to go that way. And, right. and I think you will. Yeah. Eventually, uh, you, you, you're you not going to have a choice eventually. Yeah, that's right. But here we are now. And if you want reliable energy, I'm sorry whether you like it or not. You know, fossil fuels are uh, basically the only reliable energy that we have planet wide, you know, at this point. So um, so anyway, I'm in it. Um, you know, I'm I, I wasn't always this way, David. I mean, I was a student once too, you know, so I mean, I. <laughs> I hated fossil fuels when I was a student, but, you know, as you learn more and more and more, I, I wasn't in Texas, by the way. Uh, so as you learn more and more and more, you see, oh, OK, well, now I, I'm getting it. I'm understanding, you know, what, what's and the reason and rationale. And, and by the way, they're not all devils that are working, you know, in this yeah. industry. You know, these are actually good people trying to do their jobs. Uh, so anyway, uh, now I'm getting a little philosophy. Sorry about uh, <laughs> Well, we'll we'll do we'll do another we'll do a follow up on this and, and talk philosophy. That'll be good. Okay. You, and I, you and I, I think, could have a really great discussion on 
philosophy about energy. We're, we'd love to. We'd love okay. to. Thank you. Well, for thank the you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. I've learned a lot in this discussion, and uh, that's always a great thing. That's always what I'm trying to do with these with these uh, episodes. So I really appreciate it. Uh, well, you're welcome. And, and by the way, I appreciate your articles, too. I read them every time it says David Blackman, I read it. <laughs> well, yeah, I get myself in trouble sometimes, but, uh, but uh, there's never any shortage of things to write about. That's true. Okay, well, thanks again. Right. All right. Well, thank you. And, and, and thanks to our audience for joining us today. Thanks to the Sandstone Group for hosting our podcast and to our extraordinary producer, Eric Farrell. I'm David Blackman signing off for now.